Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? I want to say hi to everybody, but especially the fourth and fifth graders in the room, because you get an opportunity to go to Club 45. I guarantee you that'll be more exciting than being in here. So have fun with that. Um, I'm Jeff Pittman, one of the pastors around here. Uh, We are in a great series called Remarkable, looking at women of the Bible. Now, every week during this series, you will hear about one woman in the Bible, but today you have a special treat because you are going to be hearing about two women in the Bible. It's a two-for-one deal today. I promise you I will not go double the time that normally preachers preach, but you'll get an extra bonus of having two women women to learn from. Now, these two women are sisters, and they are different types of people. One of them is a doer. A doer is a busybody, someone who's always active, always moving. They're accomplishing a lot of things. They never seem to get everything done, but the things that do get done, there's a lot more than other people around them. They epitomize the statement, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. You ever hear that before? Because they get things done, always active, always moving. That's one of the sisters we learn about today. The other sister we're going to learn about today is a sitter. Okay, she's a sitter. Now, when I say a sitter, I don't mean someone who just sits there in a lazy posture, but they, need to, they, they, they sit and they think and they contemplate and they spend time with other people in relationships. They're a little more conversational with other people um, as well. They value leisure time to think and to rest. There's doers in our world and there are sitters in our world. Are you a doer or are you a sitter? You know, maybe some, if you're, you're with somebody, a friend, or maybe a spouse, and they're kind of like, you know, they're edging you, they're, they're elbowing you right now, because they know which one you are. Now, one of the ways you can tell us how, a little test, is how do you handle vacations? How do you plan vacations? Now, uh, doers, what they'll do is they will get stressed out with work, so much so that they need to plan a vacation. And they say to themselves, I'm so stressed. I got so much to do. I need to get away and to get away from my, my stresses to vacation. And in a split second, they'll actually plan and pack so much into their vacation that they come back even more stressed, right? And they come back and they say this statement you've probably heard before, that they need a vacation from their vacation. You ever hear that? That's what a doer does, right? They're always active. They're always busy. So even when they have downtime, they get busy in their downtime. Now, if a sitter plans vacation, they go in and they have a vacation. They want to sit specifically on a beach somewhere, right? Maybe in a, a, sun, a sunny spot, reading a book. Maybe they go to the cabin just to play cards with people. They want to go and just relax. And it isn't just relaxing just for relaxing sake, but they want to be with people or they want to read something, want to learn something, but they mo- mostly want to take it easy. And when they come back from vacation, people ask them, what did you do? And they'll respond by saying, Nothing. I did absolutely nothing, and I loved it. I just went somewhere and was just there at, at, at that moment. Are you a sitter or are you a, do, a, a doer? Now we're going to see this two different people within the, the characters we have today. And it is found in Luke 10. So if you are following along, go to Luke 10. And we're going to start in verse 38. But let me tell you a little bit about our characters. We're looking at Martha and Mary. Now, they're not the only siblings in their family. They have their brother named Lazarus, we also see in the Bible. They don't appear to be married, so they seem to be single, um, but they do appear to have some wealth. They have a house, they have a place they can host people in, and they have like, some expensive things they get to give and use later, and later on we'll see some of those things as well. So they're wealthy. Some commentators, some theologians believe they're actually orphans, uh, but they're old enough to take care of the household, so their parents died at a certain age, so they not so young that they have to be taken care of. They can take care of the household, but they're not quite yet old enough to be married, which is about by 20 years old in that culture. So some believe that they are teenagers um, in that that age range, taking care of the household that their parents left behind them, although we don't quite know that for sure, but that's a thought that some theologians have. And we get to see them a couple times in Scripture, but the first time we see them is in Luke 10, verse 38. Why don't you follow along with me? 
It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Can you guys pick out which one is the doer and which one is the sitter here? See, Martha is a doer. She's active. She's always doing, she's, in this case, she's hospitable. She's hosting this group of people. And Mary is the sitter. And she specifically is sitting, literally sitting at the feet of Jesus. So we have Martha and we have Mary, two different, same as their sisters, but two different types of people. Now, you might have heard this story before. It's the common story we hear in the Bible. And if you are a sitter, you love this story because this story often paints doers or active people in a bad light. And they paint sitters, people who are contemplative and, and, uh, and listen to every word of Jesus in a good light. And you might say, see doers, you're not supposed to be doing so many different things. You're supposed to be doing the things that, that Jesus is saying. You're supposed to be reading your Bible endlessly for days on end and doing prayer walks for hours upon hours upon hours. That's what we're called to do instead of doing all the different activity that you do. Now, I want to temper that spirit if you're a sitter right here, okay? Because when we dive into the scriptures and the meaning of this, Jesus is not calling out and saying, don't be a doer. He just wants to have it in perspective. And so we're going to look at it today and say, we're not bad for doing, for doing things, but we want to have it within perspective and within the voice of God. So the first point we're going to have today is actually is serving God is good. Serving God is good. Now we see this throughout scripture, specifically in Jesus' ministry, that Jesus is often calling us to do things, to be active, to serve God. People. This is a good thing in our, in, to be doing. We see this throughout the scriptures, but we don't have to go too far to see it within Luke. In fact, the beginning part of Luke 10 gives examples of Jesus encouraging people serving other people. Specifically, in the, the first part of Luke 10, it's one of my favorite stories in all of scripture. You see, Jesus comes on the scene and he starts talking to people about the kingdom of God. And he starts healing people of their diseases and their challenges. But he doesn't, he doesn't keep it to himself. He actually tells his followers to do the same thing. And so he sends them out two by two to neighboring communities, neighboring towns, and he gives them some instructions. He tells them, don't, don't bring this, these things, don't bring these things. This is what you're going to do when you get there. But one of the things he tells them do is to look for a certain place to stay when they go to these towns. We picked this up in Luke 10, verse 5. It says, when you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house, when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So he's telling them to go to these different towns and to find a place that is hospitable. Find a place that is going to take care of you, that's going to feed you, that's going to care for your needs. Another way he could have said this is find Martha's. Look for people just like Martha. Because when, when Martha's your host, you will be taken care of. He's valuing people who are hosts, who are hospitable. He's valuing, va valuing doers. In fact, we didn't go into it in this part of the verse, but if you go further in Luke 10, you find out that he's ha he has some very harsh words for people who are not hospitable. People are just kind of not taking care of the needs of other people. He doesn't have very good things to say about them. Well, later on in Luke 10, we hear another story. You see, in Luke 10, we get the religious leaders of the law there, so Pharisees, people who are known for the law, and they challenge Jesus a lot, a lot of times in his ministry. 
And when they do this, they get into these kind of debates. And in this case, in Luke 10, one of, the, one of the experts of the law asks Jesus what it takes to have eternal life. And Jesus responds back and says, you must love God and you must love other people as your neighbor. And then the religious leader then calls, asks back, well, what is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And to illustrate who a neighbor is, Jesus uses this story. It's a great story. It's the story of the, great, the Good Samaritan. The story goes that there's a guy who is walking down the road and he gets mugged, he gets robbed, he gets beaten up, all his possessions are taken away from him. He's left in the side of the road, in the ditch of the road, to defend for himself, there to die. There's some, there's some religious people, some religious Jews come by and they kind of see him in the corner of the eye, but they, they move along to the other side of the road and just kind of put their, their, their hand against their eyes and hopefully they, ignore, they hope to ignore him in that regard. And so as they ignore him. Another, another guy comes by, a Samaritan comes by. And a Samaritan comes by and does something different than the religious leaders of the time. We find that out in verse 33. It says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put, on, put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. After looking after him, he said, look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You see, this call to serve other people, to look after their needs in front of yours, is something we see throughout Scripture and, not in, in, and specifically in Luke 10. So what Martha was doing actually wasn't bad, it was good. But Jesus called out some things in what Martha was doing. Let's look at specifically what those are. The first thing he called out was distraction. Martha was distracted by all the different things that she had to do. Her concern was more on her hospitality for their people than Jesus. She was more concerned with serving Jesus than actually being with Jesus. Now, for many of us, we get concerned with other things in our lives more than Jesus as well. For some of us, it is our work. That's our vocation. It's the things that we are called to do, that we are called to do for a job. And if we actually stood back and looked at our lives, we are more concerned about our job than we are with Jesus. For some of us, it's our family. It's the people that God's put into our, into our home and maybe children, it could be parents, it could be grandkids, whatever it might be. But if we really were honest with each other, we're more concerned about our family in our relationship with Jesus. For some of us, it's hobbies. It's the things that we love to do. It might be fishing or hunting or sports or collecting different things, whatever the hobby is for you. And if you're honest with yourself, you're more obsessed about that hobby than you are, are obsessed about Jesus. For some of us, it's politics. It's the things that we want to, we want to see put, put into play in the political world, and there's policies that we want to see advanced that if we were honest with each other, we're more passionate about those things than we are with Jesus. And if you are a Green Bay Packer fan and you live in Green Bay, Wisconsin, you might spend way too much time, hours and days, speculating if Aaron Rodgers will be a Green Bay Packer next year or not. And we find ourselves that we are obsessed and focused on things more than Jesus. And that's what Martha is doing. She's so focused on serving and caring and being hospitable that she misses the fact that Jesus is in her midst. We can do the same things in our lives. And it's important for us to pause from time to time and just evaluate, are there things that I'm more obsessed about, that I'm more concerned about, that take up more of my time and my energy than Jesus. If that's the case, we're in the same place as Martha is here in this story. Well, other thing he calls out in Martha is comparison. You see, he had a plan for his, her sister Mary. And that, that plan was for Mary to sit there and to listen to the words of Jesus in that moment. And Martha did not like that in this situation. She was comparing her role to Mary's role. 
And the reality is that God has called us all uniquely to something. We have a calling on our lives. He has a plan for our lives. And he actually doesn't seem to care one iota to share someone else's calling with us. In fact, what God calls someone else to is of, of no concern to our calling whatsoever. He doesn't share that with us. Did you guys know, now I'm an executive pastor here at Spring Lake Church. Did you guys know that there are, are executive pastors that are called to serve in Hawaii? Like literally paradise, right? Like they're called to, to serve my same role in paradise. But we're not called to compare what that person's calling is versus my calling. And the same thing in our lives as well. God's called you to a, to a certain way of life, to a certain calling in your life. And we're not, we're not supposed to uh, compare what he has our life to be in versus someone else's life to be called into. So we're supposed to worry about what, what, what God called us to in this regard. He calls those two things out, distraction and comparison, but he doesn't call it her service. He actually calls her service good. Well, the second point for today is that if, if serving God is good, listening to God is better. It is better. In verse 41, it says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. Now, Mary's posture in the story is one of a disciple. She actually is sitting at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus is a rabbi, and he's teaching and talking, and she's learning and consuming and taking everything that he is saying. Now, this is a spot that normally would be reserved for men in this culture. In fact, it would be uncommon and against cultural norms for Mary to sit there. Jesus does not seem to be too concerned about that at all in this case, which is one reason I love about Jesus is he constantly seems to be elevating the role of women in the culture that he is living in at that time. But Mary is there just listening and listening to what Jesus is saying. Now, Martha talks to Jesus because apparently Mary is not listening to her. Now, I, I know, we don't know in Scripture if Mary actually talked to Mary, if Martha talked to Mary. But if you've been in a sibling situation before and your sibling is doing something you don't, that you don't like, you normally go talk to them first, right? But it doesn't always normally go very well. Like in my situation, I've got four daughters, and if my oldest daughter does not like what my youngest daughter is doing, she almost always goes to my younger, younger daughter and says, Amani, you need to come with me and do these things. And do you think Amani loves listening to her older sister? Absolutely not, right? That doesn't happen in sibling worlds too often, right? So, so I'm sure Martha went to Mary and asked her to help her out in the kitchen. And Mary's like, no, 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 no. I am not doing that at all. So Martha goes to Jesus and says, I'm going to go to Jesus. Jesus is surely going to understand that. It's not a woman's place to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's supposed to be helping me in the kitchen. So Jesus will tell Mary what to do. But that's not how Jesus responds. Instead, Jesus actually, actually rebukes Martha and says that Mary has chosen what is better. In some translation, it is translated as being what is best. Other ways you can translate this is to say he's chosen the better portion. One way you can think about this is to look at like a, a pizza. You cut it into different portions, and if you cut it into different portions, you know there are better pieces of, the, of that pizza pie than others, right? Mary has chosen the better portion than Martha. And the better part is actually not sitting, but actually listening to the word of God. And in this case, Mary is literally listening to the word of God. She has chosen what is better. Listening is better. She isn't listening just for listening's sake, but she's listening when it's an extreme, important uh, dialogue that's happening. Which brings us to why. Why is listening better? See, if serving is good, listening is better, but it's better because it improves our service. Listening improves our service. Now, thankfully, this isn't the only, situ the only story we hear 
of Martha and Mary. In fact, we hear of a very similar story, a very similar setting later on in Scripture. Now, this first setting we're reading in Luke 10 is about Martha and Mary hosting Jesus in their home. And in John 12, we actually get another situation that they're hosting Jesus in their home again. But there are some differences. I want you to, as we read this, I want you to pick out what are some differences we see in this story. This is found in John, 10, John 12, starting in verse 1. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. When Mary took about a then, then, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. And so we have a similar situation. They're in the town of Bethany, and Martha is serving Jesus and a group of different people. Very similar situation. And Martha continues to do what she does best. She's a doer. She's a host. She's active in this situation. But there are some differences. Martha is no longer complaining. She doesn't seem to care what other people's roles are. She's not comparing what other people are doing versus what she's doing. She is just doing what her role is in this situation. And we have a great example in Martha here. She seemed to have learned her lesson from what Jesus gave before. Jesus called her not to, not to complain and not to compare, not get distracted. And she seems not to have been doing that as well. People can change. She's listening to God's rebuke, Jesus' rebuke, and learning from it, which is a great lesson for us all. We also see Mary is doing something different as well. She is no longer sitting at the feet of Jesus alone. In this case, she actually is anointing Jesus and putting perfume over Jesus' feet. She's wiping it up with her hair in this regard. She is doing something. She's moving from listening to being a doer. She's listening and then doing. Now, this anointing is a little bit strange for us, and to be honest with you, it would have been a little bit strange for them in that time as well. Now, she does this out of a sign of respect. It would have been noted as a sign of respect for for, a, for oil to be put over someone in Jesus' position as a rabbi. Um, but the anointing went beyond just kind of a sign of respect. It was actually, a, she was doing an anointing for burial, which was a sign of what was going to happen. Because at this point, Jesus is on the first steps of the, the Passion Week. He's coming into Jerusalem and coming to that area to actually go towards his death on a cross for you and for me. And so this, this is a step that people are going to look at, why is she doing this for Jesus' burial? We keep on talking about he's going to die, and Mary is part of this story. She's anointing Jesus for a burial, though it's a pretty, pretty uh, respected or unknown that she doesn't know this is what is going to happen in the future. She's just doing this because she, she felt this is the right thing to do. This is a pretty scandalous thing for a woman to do as well, specifically the letting of the hair down. In that culture, a woman wouldn't put her hair down instead of in the presence of her husband, and, and we have no indication that Mary was married at this point. And so for her actually to use her hair to, to wipe the feet of Jesus would have been pretty uncommon and pretty scandalous of the time. It would have been something that someone was itching to do. So it kind of gives us an example of what why did Mary do this? What, what prompted Mary to do this? Now, we don't get an indication that Jesus told her to do this. Jesus, we have no, no words here in Scripture that Jesus told Mary to go get the perfume and to use it. But something inside of Mary told her to take this very expensive jar of perfume and to use it on Jesus. This is a full year's worth of wages for someone. And she took it and within, within that moment, it can't be used again anymore. But she felt that was worth it. Just something inside of her prompted her to make this move. We would say it was the Holy Spirit within her 
was nudging her, was calling her, was telling her to do this wonderful act of respect and prophetic sign of what's going to happen, what's going to happen future in Jesus. But in the example of Mary, we see that she valued listening to God, but that wasn't the end goal. Her end goal was listening and then obeying what the voice of God is saying. So it does beg the question of how do we listen to the voice of God? Now, for us, we actually get the, the Bible with us, right? We have the, the word of God is written out for us to read and to glean truth from. We see what God wants us to do in our lives through the Bible. We also get a great picture of who God is by reading the Bible. And we should have a personal discipline of regularly diving into the Bible and reading it for what it is worth. We also encourage people to do this together, which is one of the things we do in our life groups, actually, is, is we get together with other people to read the Bible together, to glean and to learn together as a family of God what the Bible is saying. How are you doing? How's it going for your personal time of reading the Bible? God has given us a gift in the Bible and calls us actually to, if we want to understand what the voice of God says, we have it right in front of us in the Bible. If you're not doing great in that, if the answer to that question is not really, not not good at all, take some steps. Take some steps to regularly on a daily, a weekly basis to get into the Bible and read it. And if it helps, it helps a lot of us, get with other people as well, to read the Bible together. It helps us out. Well, another way we listen to the voice of God is through other believers, through other followers of Jesus. People have got wisdom that God gives other people that is supposed to be shared with us. There's people who have got different life experiences or a little further ahead in the game that we can learn a great deal from. In my life, this is Pastor Adam. Both Pastor Adam and I have four daughters in our, in our families, but his daughters are just a season ahead of us and, and th- than my girls are. And so whenever I face something with my kids or I have a challenge with my kids, I often go to Pastor Adam and say, what did you do, what did you learn when your kids were my kids' age? As a follower of Christ, and a Jesus follower, I get to glean from the wisdom of his. Do you have people in your life that can speak the word of God to you, that can encourage you, that can challenge you, that can help you discern what to do in your life. If you don't, get some people in your life. This is one of the main things we do in our life groups, actually, is we don't just read the Bible together. We actually do life together. We actually go through the challenges of life, the the difficulties, the wins. We celebrate with people as well. But we do this life together so that God can use other people to speak into our lives. Well, third way we listen to God's voice is through prayer. Now, prayer is uh, a conversation. It's us asking for things. It's us listening to God's voice. It's a dialogue between us and God. And I don't think it's a coincidence that in Luke 11, right right after the chapter we're looking at today, the disciples asked Jesus how to pray. This is a vital vital skill, a a vital discipline we need to have as Christ followers is that we actually pray, that we dialogue with Jesus. And a good key part of that is understanding the voice of the Holy Spirit. These nudges, these stirrings, these pullings, these, in some cases, audible voices. In some cases, it's just an uneasiness or a peace that comes over us to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And this can take some time to really understand the voice of the Holy Spirit, but it is attainable. Now, uh, one, there's certain things that happen with mothers and their children that just kind of boggle my mind. Now, I've got little kids, elementary school kids, and so it's pretty common for us to be with other elementary school families, and so we'll be in our house or at a park, and there'll be just a sea of chaos because we have moms coming together talking about things, we have the dads talking about some things, and then we have kids off playing in the distance, whether it be the playground or the backyard or maybe in the basement. And whenever kids come together, they inevitably get hurt. This is what happens when kids get together, right? Someone will fall down and scrape their knee and get an owie, and, and because they're hurt, they'll start crying. And then this supernatural thing happens, right? Because then the, a cry comes out from uh, the basement, and moms will just kind of like flip their ear into the air, and in a split second, 
a mom can determine if that is their kid crying or some other of the 25 kids in the basement (laughs) crying. They know their child's voice. Now, I think that is a gift that God gives to moms because I think they're superhuman, right? They're they're awesome people and God gives them gifts that are pretty amazing. But I also know that those moms have spent a lot of intimate time with that child. That mom has nursed that child. That mom has cried with that child. That mom has comforted that child. That mom has disciplined that child. That mom has laughed with that child. That mom loves that child. And in a split second, they know exactly the voice of that child. And the truth be told, that child knows the voice of the mom as well. And that happened over time, an intimate relationship. Friends, we can understand and hear the voice of God and the voice of the Holy Spirit the more intimate that we are with our relationship with God. The more time we spend in prayer, the easier we are to understand the voice of the Holy Spirit. The more time we spend reading our Bibles and being with other fellow believers, the more we get to understand the voice of the Holy Spirit. The more times we actually take a chance and actually say, God, I think you're pulling me this direction, but I'm not quite sure. But we try it out. The more times we do that, we strengthen this muscle of understanding the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the more intimate we are with God, the more we can understand the Holy Spirit. This is critically important. Because God calls out doing things just for doing sake is not what God wants us to do. God just wants us to listen to the voice of God and then obey the word of God to serve people, to care for people, to be active, to be doers. Listening precedes doing. And when the voice of God flows through us and we listen to it well, we become on mission. We become to be along the purposes of God. We're not doing just for doing sake. We're doing it because this is what God wants us to do. And God's on a pretty big mission to save and seek the lost. And when we listen, we get to be part of that mission. And we're exactly where God wants us to be. How are you doing at discerning the voice of God? I wish there was a pill you could take or an easy answer for you to learn the, the voice of God more. It's not. It's spending time with God. And the more time we spend, the more we understand his voice, and the more that what we do is aligned with the purposes of what God wants. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for our time together and the fact that you voice, that you actually want to communicate with us. You give us the Bible, you give us other people, but you also speak directly to us through the Holy Spirit. What a gift that is. My prayer for, for us this morning and as people listen to us later on, that we would get better at discerning the voice of God that we have time that is deep and rich and intimate, so much so that we just know your voice so clearly, so accurately, that we become so effective in being doers of the word. It's your son's name we pray. Amen.